All right, this is uh, part two of the keynote lecture for rural development and resource-oriented sanitation. So the next uh, step, um, when we want to go for regenerative agriculture, agroforestry, rainwater harvesting and all that, we need many people that are involved. These systems will not just come by themselves and they need to be maintained. And so I'm very strongly promoting to uh, keep family farms going, strengthening them. But we also need to create uh, more opportunities in rural areas, maybe by garden communities. Um, and once again, family farms feed the world. So if we have uh, restoration, as in the example that I've shown before, us going from uh, degraded land um, that is barren and then with uh, proper methods having abundance uh, like that. Uh, this is something uh, that needs to be kept intact and that is why we need small family farms. Um, around 70% of all food worldwide is produced by family farms. And many of those are not very efficient yet, so they could improve many fold in many cases. Um, and uh, they are, well, the most sustainable uh, thing in many cases, because it's like uh, people working with the land in a way that is, uh, well, restored and the water cycle restored and kept intact. And, um, if we go for uh, well done productive family farms that are building humus and keeping vegetation cover all year round and producing lots of food, reproducing the water, uh, that's the best thing that can happen, happen. And that can give billions of people uh, great employment, uh, mostly of course self-employment. Um, and that would be something that could go a long way. So if we look at um, conventional management of uh, farms as it is today, we can state that hardly any farm is uh, doing the basics in a proper way. So there are maybe a few 10,000 farms that are getting everything right, <clears throat> but um, we need to look at the basics and so a great uh, overview on this is uh, given by uh, John Kempf. Uh, he has uh, the website advancing uh, um, eco uh, ag um, and advancing eco, eco agriculture and he has uh, developed something what he calls the plant health pyramid. So there are specific, very clear prerequisites if soil is uh, to be kept healthy, productive, and if the food that is produced is healthy for people. And most soils around the world are lacking important uh, minerals and trace elements. Thus, production cannot work well. So um, this is something where there is some fundamental understanding that is not covered in this lecture in detail, uh, but uh, we have to take care that we have specific um, substances here to get higher in productivity. Uh, and uh, then when that is taken care of, then we go for uh, soil uh, biology and then the whole system works with like uh, microbes or fungi um, and uh, it can become very very efficient because microbes or fungi so these uh, synergistic um, soil fungi that work with plants uh, they can extend a root from like a meter to a thousand meters just by uh, the mycelium uh, that is running and can go uh, even even deep into the ground and so on. The fact that this is ignored 
around the world still is simply a, a lack of scientific uh, recognition. The whole business is driven by business and not by, uh, well, the, the conscious decision what is a good and healthy system because healthy systems don't need those internal uh, the, those external inputs that much and uh, so there is uh, a, a lot of uh, development that has gone into the wrong direction uh, so with that said i'll jump into some great examples and um, so for small scale um, agriculture like family farms, uh, permaculture operations uh, and so on. Um, there is a great example um, from uh, La Ferme du Bec uh, in, in, in France and a great book uh, Miraculous Abundance has shown um, that a lot of things can be done if all the good things that are known basically are brought together with conventional uh, horticulture they were running bankrupt and that's what you le learn at uh, school at, at the moment and uh, so they have searched for everything that is available and thanks to the internet they could get all these things together and uh, they became enormously productive so much that a research group of uh, the national um, research research organization of france made a four-year study and they could show that on only a thousand square meters there could be income of 40 to 50 thousand euros uh, or dollars uh, produced and this includes all the cost for seeds um, it includes uh, work that is needed for marketing and all that and so this is showing how much can be produced on uh, well managed plots of land so instead of bigger and bigger uh, many farmers are going now smaller and smaller because uh, it's better to run a small uh, plot very efficiently and have enough material to feed the humus and all that and uh, have rather quality products than uh, like huge uh, uh, amounts of wheat or other um, well crops that are not so well paid and not all that healthy also so suggestion is to go for like sweet chestnut from agroforestry rather than eating wheat all the time and that is also help, helping nature because you can produce as much on the same space but at the same time you have uh, trees uh, there is space for grazing there is beauty in the region um, plenty of space for insects birds and um, that's a win-win-win situation and uh, this development is, has become really really strong so i'm confident that this will absolutely go to scale because it does make so much sense and this is just one example there are more examples of small farms that um, produce uh, th these um, amounts of uh, well money from from small spaces and uh, at the same time this requires a full job but on the positive uh, end it has created a job and in my point of view the uh, future of family farms it not is not that people work from uh, morning to to night every day but that you share the work so that you do maybe one third of the work on on the land maybe half of uh, it and then work on a desk makes more sense so we we have far too many people always sitting at a desk and getting getting ill and others that are working uh, out in the fields uh, day by day by day and getting ill from that and so the combination would be so much nicer attractive lifestyles so um, these ideas of of making um, well like small farms around cities 
is not all that new. So that was the Garden Cities of Tomorrow that was published in uh, around the 1902 uh, in the UK. And so these uh, clusters of family farms are nearby a city so they can deliver, deliver fresh food and uh, also help, well, uh, keep the land around the city uh, healthy. Um, and uh, then also if we convert from like these uh, low um, ecological uh, density or, or species to high species so if we convert to like permaculture plots we can have uh, tenfold as many species and a lot of that is edible we will have space for many many um, insects and uh, bird life and uh, wildlife in general and that can create a healthy environment and uh, that is something what is uh, well also making the region more beautiful uh, it can create uh, with part-time commercial gardening multiple activities something like entrepreneurs uh, towns or garden communities of 100 maybe up to i would rather say 300 people uh, this is an older number that came back with this slide um, and create interesting neighborhoods uh, not necessarily a closed community but have enough interesting people around so that life in the rural is highly attractive what it can be obviously and, uh, this could like be the conversion of from like monoculture to polyculture this would be creating a lot more food and uh, high quality food if that could look like that and that would be like a garden community and uh, this is a concept that is now on the way so many people are getting interested in that but it requires some uh, cooperation with people from farming from uh, land management um, so it's not so easy to make projects on that scale uh, but it's on the way and it's also building on the work of the uh, eco-village movement that is around since uh, several decades um, yeah restoration requires people and so we need uh, to um, keep these areas that have been uh, well revived uh, keep it living so if people are leaving nobody's caring for the land this will be lost uh, at some point and so there could be such uh, garden communities that are taking care of the land and uh, be productive and happy working with nature and of course there will be these areas like in the higher ranges that are then completely natural areas uh, but uh, humans can live with nature in a very good way and uh, this is something that I would really uh, strongly recommend as a great tool for creating a great future for all and getting to the green planet instead of the desert planet. All right, so um, I will continue now with um, the topic of uh, resources oriented uh, sanitation and wood gas energy and as mentioned before solve all the major major problems together so that's why we cover so many different topics here uh, if we talk about uh, dealing with wastewater um, the first thing should be to economize on water usage so uh, for example one that can go a very long way is to uh, have low flow shower heads uh, showers are uh, wasting a lot of uh, water and there are some models that are really very uh, very efficient and still pleasant at six liters per minute uh, that's two gallons per minute um, around 
and um, this saves lots of water and energy and it can save people 200 euros per person and year but unfortunately not many models are really safe because if you have models that are pro uh, producing uh, aerosols that can become pretty dangerous because like um, there is uh, well uh, legionella and uh, so that should be uh, considered and this model is hygienically very safe uh, and it creates bubbles so there is the drops that come come out are hollow so it's only relatively little water but it feels like a good shower i i have this in my house since 10 15 years and it's it's absolutely great and so we reduce the volume of water and wastewater generated in the first place now um, if we look at water consumption we have a so-called real water consumption and we have virtual water and if we look at the numbers so normally many industrial countries like germany are using 125 liters on average per person and day uh, but if you look at the total water consumption this is huge it's around 4000 liters and uh, this is because of all the products that we are buying uh, very often from other parts of the world so that's why it's called virtual water it's not virtual at all that's real water that is abstracted in other parts of the world very often compromising the livelihoods of people in the region so that's not acceptable um, now if we look at a city we do get water supply we have food uh, we get energy the city is producing solid waste it is uh, producing wastewater and uh, if we look at that um, that looks pretty normal to us uh, but as soon as we look um, what is going on we see well there is another city here there may be a river and along that river uh, one city is putting wastewater in a place where the other city is taking its water so there is a shortcut from uh, wastewater to drinking water and that's really strange um, that's where um, well a lot of uh, illness is spreading and uh, around only around 20 percent of all wastewater is treated at all on a global scale so if this wastewater here goes without any treatment of course that's highly dangerous from a hygienic point of view very many people die from that millions of children die from polluted water even now and this is absolutely uh, crazy because that must not be it's like if we have uh, good systems in place that's not necessary but our systems are not good so far and also the conventional system as i've shown here is far from ideal it's hardly any reuse and uh, so let's jump into what we can do otherwise um, so um, this is uh, well some history so in uh, hamburg there was just as an example uh, there were very very many people um, dying uh, in here in hamburg uh, due to a cholera epidemic and these cholera epidemics were devastating and uh, the, the the cause was that uh, the the river water was contaminated and with that people were um, well uh, infected from the drinking water system because there was no proper filtration in place excreta went into the waters uh, untreated and uh, so this is a situation that we unfortunately do still have in many many parts of the world 
So on top of that, the flush sanitation system has linear mass flows. Uh, there is very little reuse and flush sanitation has broken the nutrient cycle. Excuse me. And now, um, and because the nutrients are mainly going out or into incineration and so on, there is very, very little reuse. Even if the sludge is reused, what is done less and less and less, uh, that doesn't bring uh, m much of the nutrients back because they cannot be accumulate, uh, accumulate, uh, accumulated so easily. To some extent, it works for phosphate and there is new legislation out, but it's not working in total for like potassium and nitrogen, all that. Um, uh, nutrients are uh, depleted on land, then agrochemical agriculture is uh, using fossil resources and pollutes the groundwater um, only because we don't have those sustainable systems in place. And uh, that's where we should get, so to have uh, systems that are regenerating themselves, regenerative san um, sanitation or wastewater systems. So now I'll show you how that is possible. Uh, we have good examples from industry. So the old paradigm in industry was to, to get all the water in, collect everything in one sewer, and then there is a treatment plant that treats it all. And that has its limitations. Reuse is very difficult, treatment is difficult. And uh, industry has seen, ah, oh, this is pretty expensive and has moved into the direction of making systems for each production unit. So actually all the different um, characteristics of wastewater, if they are nearby, are put into one recovery plant. And then uh, this plant is not just uh, well, uh, lessening the damage to the environment, but it's actually producing uh, reuse water and can also often recover raw materials in a good way. So as you see, the water input has shrunk a lot, smaller expenditure, and also much less wastewater, less wastewater fees, and there are even those zero emissions concepts where we don't have any wastewater at all. This is possible for many branches, but it's not all that easy. So can the same work in housing areas? And that was my question 30 years back when I started to realize that our sanitation systems are not working out. I did a lot of modeling of wastewater systems and the mass flows are simply not working out. And so, um, I found that if we look at what is in the wastewater, we find that there is the big volume of the gray water. So that's all the wastewater without the toilet wastewater. But that urine and feces are actually very, very small compared to the big amount of the gray water. And uh, if we have different types of systems, we can actually save a lot of water, so this flush water wouldn't be necessary if we make a separation and uh, make this part of a fertilizer factory and make this part of a water uh, reuse system. And so that's something what I've worked on for the last 30 years and uh, some others as well. And so let's look into systems. Um, if we do this separation, we can either deal with urine and feces together or even separate those further. Uh, I will show the technology, um, but uh, there is a lot of different ways to do that. And on the other hand, it's really difficult if there is, um, well, central sewerage in place already. So then it's becoming very difficult. But talking about rural areas, often there is not a lot, a lot of infrastructure there. And then 
uh, innovative systems, leapfrogging to innovative systems does make a lot of sense. And so just look how much uh, of the nutrients is just in the urine. Uh, most of the nitrogen, lots of phosphate, potassium and so on. And uh, excreta has got the lion's share of uh, the uh, well organic matter and can be transformed to um, soil conditioners. So different toilet systems. Um, I uh, personally started with systems uh, based on uh, vacuum toilets and well 30 years after I started such systems uh, many people have followed up on that and now such systems are built a lot. Uh, separating flush toilets, uh, we have worked on that. Development uh, came mainly from Sweden, uh, but I am not too convinced anymore. We tried a lot of projects, but many of them didn't really work out very well, um, even though waterless urinals are very successful. So that's a way of capturing urine and saving lots of water. Then there are these uh, composting toilets or desiccation toilets, ideally with urine diversion, UDDT then. And uh, what we have developed is uh, container toilets, lactic acid fermentation. Um, so let's look into some of those projects. Such systems are not uh, at all uh, completely new. So this is uh, an ancient system from Sana'a, the capital city of Yemen uh, in the uh, well Middle East. And uh, it's a very, very dry area. So people knew how to deal with uh, very, very dry situations. So they made toilets uh, that looked like this. And so excreta were just falling through a hole into a chamber here. It's a very small volume, if not uh, flushed. And the urine would like run out and actually uh, be evaporated outside the building on a specific material. And uh, then it created um, a full fertilizer because all that uh, stuff when the urine is evaporating makes uh, a high quality fertilizer. Uh, today this system doesn't exist anymore and it's even completely gone unfortunately um, and since flush sanitation is implemented uh, the water table in the region is just dropping very very fast and so they have a bleak future if they don't manage to deal with water in a different way. It's also, of course, for ined inadequate uh, agriculture, but uh, the city does play uh, quite a role. And, and on top of that, because people still save water, flush sanitation is always clogging. So people must be forced to use more water, flush water. So such systems do not make sense in a resource efficient society. So more modern systems in the same way, um, urine um, diversion dry toilets. So um, these toilets here uh, in the front part, um, uh, they have uh, urine diversion. So that would be the toilet and urine goes out here and in a, into a tank and excreta is dropping into these chambers and after half a year this is uh, swapped so that the uh, stuff can uh, desiccate and be taken out without a smell and hygienic risk. So many systems like that have been developed. Also this development came from, from Sweden to a large extent. There's also a nice book about these types of systems and they do have their place for very rural areas, remote areas. All right, so um, this is a version of uh, urine diversion dry toilet that is on the market, very successful model from Sweden. 
uh, from the company uh, separate. And the idea is also that in the front part of the toilet there is uh, urine, uh, urine going in and uh, so that can be collected um, and uh, the back part is uh, for like the excreta and there is a, a flap that is closing after utilization so this toilet is quite nice I uh, use it myself on my piece of land that I use as a like weekend house for the moment uh, so those work relatively well but it's not really for very densely populated areas so much it's more for rural areas um, in the Netherlands they have taken up a lot of the the work that uh, some people including me had started and they really went ahead and uh, have huge numbers of, of installed projects and one of those is a pilot plant for fertilizer production from urine and even 1,000 cubic meters per year. So lots of development is going on and new systems are available. Um, myself, I started a lot earlier than that and this was in the like starting from 1995 and uh, I, I learned that the mixing of excreta and the rest of the wastewater doesn't make a lot of sense what I learned from the math mathematical modeling. And uh, when I started my own consultancy in Lübeck near the Baltic Sea, I had the opportunity to take part in the development of a uh, ecological uh, development of the city of Lübeck. And uh, so with some others, we developed uh, new ways to deal with water, wastewater and energy. And in this case, I uh, designed a system where these houses have um, vacuum toilets that are not, sub not uh, connected to the rest of the wastewater. Those are connecting to um, a biogas plant and uh, can produce good fertilizer. So that's some of the, that's the vacuum station. Uh, this is inlet for uh, solid bio waste, uh, sanitization, mixing unit and so on. And the digester is here bit behind the wall. And this system was designed for 250 people. Uh, and uh, for the gray water, um, we installed a constructed wetland. That's still very nice technology for rural areas because a lot of the um, investment can be done in the form of labor rather than uh, expensive investment. And it's, it can also be very energy um, uh, efficient. So the wastewater is distributed uh, at the top of a gravel field sand uh, uh, coarse sand, fine gravel, and then it's uh, trickling down here, and then uh, the clean water is collected and put out. And uh, this is a picture from the construction. A liner is needed. You need around two square meters per person, so it's relatively doable in rural area areas. And so that's what it looks like. People live right near to it and works out fine and uh, the water looks very clean at the end. All right so that's the gray water treatment um, and uh, so these systems um, with the vacuum, uh, vacuum toilets, um, they are really well in increasing now so we had uh, thousands of visitors in Lübeck, um, the project that was opened in uh, year 2000, the World Exhibition World Expo 2000. And uh, many of the visitors got inspiration and also uh, me and other people active in this field, but only a handful of people. We inspired many people to go ahead with that. And uh, so there is also a huge project now in Hamburg for around uh, 
2,000 inhabitants, so just a different scale. And they have also developed some further um, ideas for producing more energy from the biogas plant and so on. And more are on the way. Another development that was invented by Ulrich Braun, who has deceased uh, around three years back, and his idea was to uh, make a system for the toilet, once again separating the two, black water and uh, rest of the wastewater, have a unit that is processing it, and uh, then you can reproduce flush water. So it's a closed loop system. Uh, fresh water demand can be further reduced by uh, having a, a, a gray water loop. So the water would be treated and uh, recirculated and uh, the fresh water demand of such a system can go down to only 10 to 20 liters per person and day. So that's the black water and blue water loop system, most efficient that is possible, and it eliminates uh, most of the pharmaceutical residues, what no other system can do so far from what is feasible. Um, this is, well, we have been able to build one of those, um, and this is a membrane bioreactor. Uh, this is the bioreactor, and then we need further treatment with uh, nanofiltration to eliminate the uh, color of the urine. That's very uh, difficult to degrade. Uh, but if that is taken out through a very fine nanofiltration, uh, the pharmaceutical residues are also taken out. Then, my favorite system after all these years, and that's what we call, uh, call Terra Preta sanitation. Um, it seems that these ancient cultures in the Amazon that lived there for thousands of years with millions and millions of people, that they had a type of uh, way to, to convert excreta and bio waste into the best soil on earth by mixing some uh, charcoal into it and probably they had toilets, can't be proven historically, but it's very likely that they had uh, container toilets like this, so they may have been here in such places. Uh, there is some leachate visible here from uh, the excavations that have been done. And uh, so that inspired us to develop something like this, because making the best soils in the world by sanitation and bio waste management, how, how can we do that any better? That's absolutely great. And uh, so uh, Terrapeta sanitation, uh, we had a big competition uh, and we had uh, a winning model and so this is a uh, container toilet where excreta of, of a family can be collected for uh, around a week. And then either it's uh, pumped out from outside uh, in single floor houses or put further down in, in um, houses with more floors. So that's a system, very cheap, very simple, doesn't require uh, sewage systems, uh, full reuse is possible, and with a little water nozzle the, the toilet can be cleaned, so it's not completely dry. We don't separate urine here because also the urine must be collected and transported and treated, and uh, so we collect this together, and this system um, can like be having a intermediate tank uh, in the basement or uh, below the, the uh, pedestrian uh, uh, pathways. And this is something that can really uh, be um, replacing flush toilets. And uh, this is something that is available for uh, regions with very poor economies and it's also available for countries with uh, thriving uh, uh, economy. So it's uh, pleasant systems can be built for all and that's what I really like. Um, 
So bio waste can also be put in through these incinerators, but it should not be too much dilution. All right, so um, of course that would lead to composting and some uh, charcoal would go into that. So adding charcoal um, will make it the terra preta with this uh, inspiration from the Amazon. And uh, for charcoal production, I was doubtful at the beginning if that's a good idea because it's uh, basically energy. Uh, but then I learned that there are uh, wood gas stoves that are a lot more efficient. And these wood gas stoves, uh, they um, can really um, well produce uh, heat for cooking and charcoal at the same time. And uh, so the remaining uh, dusty part of the charcoal would go into the compost and the rest of the charcoal can be brought to the market and families can have a good income by that. Um, it would even be possible to have power generation by like a small Stirling engines that are uh, possible, not widely available still, but it's like, uh, it's also a nice component, uh, but also larger uh, wood gas units are possible where there is a co-generation of power, heat and charcoal production from wood and woody waste. In this case, this is one in Senegal and that runs on rice husk. That is absolutely useless otherwise. And we were able in a project to, uh, to, to restore the soil fertility of the um, paddy fields there that had lost fertility after uh, well being operated for like 25 years in a conventional way. So, yeah, that's the application of um, charcoal that we did there, uh, trials with composting. And um, so that was a project uh, that was developed by uh, Jörg Fingers from Climate Farming. And uh, now back to this, uh, that we have all these linear mass flows. Um, even with those systems, we can have a recovery of nutrients and water because if we do proper treatment and um, then instead of going into the receiving waters, uh, we would go into uh, reuse on land. And so that works very well in warm climates or hot climates uh, where there is no winter season. And uh, this could be a bamboo plantation, for example. And uh, this could be um, looking like this. This is actually a wastewater treatment uh, plant that looks like a small bamboo forest, very, very beautiful. And it's producing very, very much bamboo, very high price product, it can be used for construction, uh, for fuel and many more things. And uh, that would make a very nice uh, system after all. So plenty of options. We see very little creativity uh, in most well wastewater structures because people are sort of stuck with what they have always done and that's uh, a real pity. Uh, but uh, well meanwhile there are more and more interesting projects coming out and with that more examples are giving, systems are maturing and so on. So I think we are on a good way there, but still a lot of um, well, more research and implementation are needed. All right, so that's it about sanitation. And now we come into rural and city. And what you don't see behind the video uh, is win-win situation. All right, so it's um, cities are 100% dependent on supplies from outside, be it water, be it food, be it um, whatever goods necessary. And um, there are scenarios if there would be a major blackout, what could 
easily happen now because the earth magnetic field is weakening very very much so easily there could be a solar flare that is wiping out electricity over a l large part of the globe if not uh, all over if that uh, is a longer flare uh, and uh, that would kick us back not into middle ages but into stone age uh, and uh, there is uh, well too little uh, notice given to that because these solar flares would well destroy all um, electronics and then uh, the power production wouldn't work uh, transport wouldn't work the way of agriculture we have today that's highly dependent on high energy inputs wouldn't work anymore and so there should be more resilience from uh, well intelligent systems around cities so that's uh, where we should have uh, some people not all moving out of the cities um, and uh, become productive in um, like uh, garden rings uh, around the city and when the soils are restored we will have water uh, renewal and uh, the groundwater table may actually rise what it does when you do regenerative agriculture and um, this would be sort of less dependent on uh, outside energy sources and the city could become much more stable even under difficult situations um, so today it's uh, more than 50 percent of all people living in cities and uh, estimations are that this will increase to 70 percent in my point of view this doesn't make any sense and so there should be like maybe a better balance with 30 percent of people in cities and 30 percent in rural areas provided they work with nature and uh, improve the productivity and beauty of nature what they easily can uh, i have shown you some examples and now uh, this would be like reversing urbanization, re reverse the forced environmental migration, what is a huge problem in many parts of the world. And it's absolutely catastrophic for people to be forced off their land because uh, the soil is destroyed and um, there is no rain anymore. And as I said, it can be reversed. Restoration is possible at very reasonable cost and then uh, people can have a good life in in rural areas the climate would be more balanced and all that um, and uh, with that we could have like garden communities and garden rings around cities homework so please for all of you that are in the class and uh, everybody else is invited as well uh, homework is looking at the documentary of andrew millison who has described india's water revolution and he calls this the biggest permaculture project on earth i've mentioned it above so there is the link please look at this one and if you like a few other ones and further recommended videos uh, lessons of the lost plateau from china john liu and you can also have a look at new tree burkina faso so that's some homework and to wrap up uh, now summary soil regeneration is number one if you remember uh, sustainable development goals we cover so many of those and most is hinged on uh, soil restoration regenerative agriculture can play a big role in that agroforestry combined with rainwater harvesting then family far farms feed the world make more of those garden communities where people can live a happy life we have good solutions for sanitation and that can combine well with wood gas energy that is the only sustainable uh, bioenergy on large scale um, and rural and the city uh, resilience through 
a living surroundings. And with that, I think we should have the scenario that we move towards the green planet. And I'm pretty sure we managed to do so. Join in, all hands needed and all hearts as well. So I thank you very much for your interest and uh, I hope you well, will be able to contribute to a wonderful planet and a good future for all in the way that is suitable for you. Thank you very much.